All right, the, the man that you probably want to hear in the Genesis study. The one that would have the most description in Genesis 10, but it's a bad note. This guy's a bad guy. He was responsible for literally billions of souls burning in hell. He was basically the devil's right-hand man. He's the forerunner. Uh, he prepares the way as a typology of the Antichrist and everything. His name is Nimrod. So Nimrod, he is the son of Cush, and you're going to notice that. So this is the man that we're going to be studying next. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 10. We left off with verse... Eight, and Cush begat Nimrod. So, in other words, he, gave, uh, he was able, uh, through his wife, give birth to Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. So, he started to rise up to become very great, well-known, a legend, a mighty one throughout all the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. It, uh, in the presence, before God's face, he was known to be a mighty hunter. And it even became legendary and told throughout time and history because of that wording, wherefore it is said. So then it's been, uh, that's why it's being spoken of as, that's what the wording is, from that one, wherefore it is said. And it repeats again, even. So that means uh, including, likewise, the same, really special, particularly specially Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now some people might take, some people might take that as a positive reference, but it's not really a positive reference. When the Bible says Nimrod is a mighty hunter before the Lord, look at Genesis 13. Genesis 13. Before the Lord does not mean a positive reference. It can be something very, very evil. Let's look at Genesis chapter 13. When you're something before the Lord, it doesn't mean all the time it's a good thing. It can be something that's very, very bad. Amen. All right, let's look at Genesis chapter 13. And a great example, which some of you have known the infamous story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, obviously, with their sin of homosexuality, uh, sodomy, and etc. We know that this is not something that's positive in the Lord's eyes. It's something that's very evil and negative. Look at verse 13, Genesis 13, 13. That's a good number, right? Genesis 13, 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and what? Sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Notice right here, they were wicked and sinners before the Lord. You notice that? Exceedingly. So how we know it's a negative reference is because before the Lord can have a reference to something that's bad. That's one. Sometimes it can do that. Two, because of the wording behind it. Wicked and evil exceedingly. Right? So that should be pretty obvious that it's a negative reference connotation. So if there's a negative connotation, so take it this way. When you have a negative connotation, a negative word that's before the Lord, then you know that it's a bad dude. Now go back to uh, Genesis 10 and let me show you some crazy things here. First of all, notice right here it says mighty hunter before the Lord. So you already have the negative connotation there, and that's hunter, hunter. You might say, I thought that uh, hunt is a good word. No, actually, if you look throughout the Bible about the word hunt, it's usually a negative connotation. There's even one where uh, it seems to be something uh, very, very bleak and dark, where there are some scholars who research Nimrod's life, and they actually said, some of these scholars, when they mentioned about Nimrod, mighty hunter before the Lord, they meant that he was hunting for souls. So in other words, he was uh, hunting down souls 
Why? So that he could catch the prey for himself, like the devil. The devil's job is to hunt down and catch souls for himself. So we see a negative connotation right here concerning Nimrod. And not only that, if you look at several examples of people who are hunters, it's not really a good, uh, it's not really a good person in the Bible. Uh, one example is Esau. He was good in hunting. But then we know that Esau, he represented as a bad typology or an evil typology in the Bible. Another example is Ishmael. Ishmael, the Bible says that he would be a wild man. So he was good in fighting, hunting, and etc. So we know that he represented as a bad typology in the Bible as well. So Nimrod would be the same. Not only that, the children of Israel throughout the Bible. There are some references where it seems like that God mentioned about the Gentiles or Israel's enemies hunting them down. So that shows that it's a negative connotation. And by the way, the Lord, it also even shows the Lord can use these hunters to accomplish an evil purpose. Well, why would the Lord do that? Because the Lord's not going to let anything go to waste. If a person is going to commit evil and God's going to let evil happen to them, he'll have an evil, per uh, an evil person accomplish an evil purpose for him. Sometimes the Lord will do that. So we see right here a negative connotation just like Genesis 13, 13 about Sodom. So thus we know Nimrod's a bad dude. Another thing to understand, which is very, very interesting, the Bible says Genesis 13, 13, right, about Nimrod. Nimrod, he matched with Sodom and Gomorrah in what way? Sodom and Gomorrah is mentioned in 1313. Nimrod is the 13th from Adam. That's also very, very interesting. So then he was the lineage, the 13th lineage, line from Adam. Now if you look up the number 13 in your Bible, there's a lot of strong... What you're going to find out, find out, there's a lot of strong references for Nimrod matching as a negative connotation. No doubt about it. Nothing positive. When the Bible says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Let's look at another case right here. Go back to Genesis 13 where it talks about Sodom. Go back to Genesis 13. Well, actually Genesis 14, excuse me, Genesis 14. But when you look at Nimrod, his name means rebel or panther. His name means rebel or panther. Now, if you think about some of these groups that talk about being rebels and doing so-called peaceful protests or rebellious protests, and some of them like to dub themselves as panthers, then you know that that's not a good reference. They're following the example that the same spirit that was in Nimrod then. That's the same spirit. Now, Nimrod means rebel, but 13, for some of you who didn't know, 13 also means rebellion, rebel. For some of you who didn't know that, that's what the number 13 represents. That's why 13 is not a good number in your Bible. All right, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 14. Notice that 13 ties to rebellion. In verse 4, 12 years they served Chedorlaomer, and in the what? What year? What number? In the 13th year. They rebelled. All right, let me know if I'm out of bounds. So notice right here, in the 13th year, they rebelled. So 13 represents rebellion in your Bible, and that matches with Nimrod's name. There's no doubt, it's a negative connotation. There's too many references, too many references to point this out. Let's return to Genesis chapter 10, and then I want you to go to Revelation 6. Genesis chapter 10 and Revelation chapter 6. For some of you who don't know, 
When people go out hunting during those biblical days, how did they do hunting like Esau? How did they do hunting? They did it with the bow and arrow. That's how they hunt. Why? Because they didn't have guns back then. So then in order to hunt down an animal, they had to shoot it. And in order to shoot it, that's why you get that bow and arrow. So Nimrod, when you look up some archaeological references concerning about this character, the Bible calls him Nimrod. History puts different names for this character. But this Nimrod, it shows him holding a bow and arrow sometimes. So they would tie a bow and arrow to Nimrod. Not only that, if you were to think about this, the Bible says he was a mighty hunter, right? So we know then he would have a bow and arrow. That's why he typifies the Antichrist so much. Because the Antichrist, he comes out with a bow. Look at Revelation 6. Revelation chapter 6. Nimrod is rich in, with references to the Antichrist. The Bible points out at verse 2, And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So that's the Antichrist, the infamous white horseman in Revelation 6 that you've heard before. So what you've heard before about this white horseman being the Antichrist, notice he has a bow, okay? So having a bow, he richly represents the Antichrist. There's a lot more why he represents the Antichrist. Another thing about Nimrod, for some of you who didn't know, is that he is known to be a one-world ruler. You might say he was a one-world ruler. Yeah, because of history. There's too many historical references. Not only that, it's also interesting the Bible says his kingdom was in verse 10, Babel, right? That's the first mention of kingdom, king, and ruler. So see, he's a, there's no doubt a ruler, a world ruler. Now, is it the entire world? Well, it's done at Babel. You notice that, right? Do you know uh, where Babel would go? At verse, the last part of verse 10 says, in the land of Shinar, Right? In verse 10, the land of Shinar. If you look at chapter 11, verse 1, and the whole what? Earth, right? The whole world right there. All one world. You notice that? Where did this take place in verse 2? The land of where? Shinar. There's no doubt Nimrod was doing, it was doing what the Antichrist will do in the future. A one world government. One world kingdom, one world power. It's rich. It's all over throughout your Bible. Nimrod definitely represents the Antichrist. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. Being 13, we see too many references to rebellion for some of you who don't know. Dr. Upman writes here at page 274 of his Genesis commentary, the 13 stars and stripes of the 13 states with E pluribus unum, 13 letters, and the dismembered snake, don't tread on me, 13 letters, bear witness to the 13 arrows on the dollar bill eagle who carries the 13 leaves under his 13 stars of David, that a war of rebellion, which was 1776, or a civil war, the 13 stars with the bars has to be there. Now, all, are some of you taking out your dollar bills right now and taking a look at that one? It's really nuts, isn't it? So there's no doubt there's something with the number 13. There is no doubt about that. If you look at Jeremiah 13, go to Jeremiah 13, you take the root of Nimrod's name. So remember, it's in Hebrew, right? It's in Hebrew where the Bible wrote it, his name. So Nun, Mem, and Resh, all right? Nun, Mem, Mem and Resh. If you take that, I'll just uh, turn it into English right here.
So in our English letters, it's roughly, roughly, okay? Obviously, it's not 100% uh, solid, but roughly, it's like this, nun, mem, and resh. For some of you who don't know, it means spotted. Now, do you remember what the Antichrist is? I want you to look at, uh, there's, too many ta there's too many connections here. There's no doubt about it. Look, look at Jeremiah 13. Notice what chapter is that. Jeremiah chapter what? 13. All right. Now, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter, guess what number? 13. Look at this. Of course, you have these critics saying that Stephanus or some of these people, they put chapters and verse numbers in your Bible and you KJV only advocates make a big deal. It's not inspired and stuff like that. Well, I'm not going to say right here in public that it's inspired, but I ain't going to dismiss it and say that, oh, these are just numbers and it's some natural man's working. There's too many, there's too many connections on what the Word of God shows. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23 can the who, Ethiopian, change his skin? Notice right here, it's referring to what? Ham seed. Remember that? Nimrod is from whose line? Ham, right? All right, so we see Ham's lineage right here. Through Ham's lineage, that's where Ethiopians came from. Remember that? I showed that last time to you. All right, notice... We know that Nimrod, he's related to the, where the Ethiopians came from. Ham's line, right? Okay, so if he's tied to Ham's line, not only that, underneath here, Ham's uh, lineage comes out a great typology of who? The Antichrist, right? Is there, uh, is there, is there a connection with Ham's line and the Antichrist? With Nimrod, yes, all three are tied right here. Right here, right here, and right here, all right? So look at how all three are tied right here. We see Ham at Jeremiah 13, 23. But look at right here, or the what? Leopard, his what? Spots. The leopard is spots. Nim Nimrod's name can go to spotted right here. That's the Antichrist. The leopard with his spots. Go to J Revelation 13. Revelation 13. John calls it the mark of a leopard. All right, what's the mark of a leopard? It's like a spot, a black spot. Look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a who? Leopard. And notice he has a mark. Look at verse 17, verse 17. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the who? Beast. So notice right here that the leopard, which is the Antichrist, has a mark. And his mark is what? Spot. So all of this is tied, there's no doubt. Nimrod is a bad guy. That's what we got in conclusion. He's an evil person. He so much represents the Antichrist and what he would do in the future. They're all tied together. Okay, let's look back at Genesis 10. That's the reason why there are, you're going to hear some people online or other preachers who believe that the Antichrist will be Nimrod. Why? Because there's too many connections with uh, Nimrod and the Antichrist. So there are some people who believe that the Antichrist will be Nimrod. Now me, I don't think so because I already taught you the Revelation studies about the Antichrist. But what I believe is this. What I believe more if be, from studying Revelation chapter 12 about the seven-headed dragon is, and the, if we look at Revelation 13, about those ten kings within that beast, what is it? Nimrod is one of those heads. And they all share with the other nine kings the same spirit who rules over the world. That's Satan. 
Luke 4, Satan says, all these kingdoms will I give to you. That's what I see it as. I see why they're all connected to the Antichrist is pretty simple, because they all share that same spirit, Satan. Okay, let's go back to Genesis chapter 10. Some other references concerning Nimrod before I read onward right here is concerning Genesis chapter 10 and verse 10 now. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. So that's the, the start, the first mention of kingdom in your Bible. So Nimrod's kingdom began, it's pretty uh, self-explained, Babel, that's his kingdom. And Erek, so he had another domain, Erek and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. All of these different cities that he dominated was in the land of Shinar. Now, before I uh, continue reading on with these cities here, you find something interesting in Genesis 10.10, 10, right? So then we come to the next number in your Bible. The next number is the number 10. You might say, what is 10? 10 represents Gentile. 10 represents Gentile. Notice your first Gentile kingdom mentioned at Genesis chapter 10 and verse 10. Dr. Ruckman mentions here, which is some interesting references, he says in page 275 of his Genesis commentary, the tenth man from Adam... If you look through Adam's lineage, the 10th person, the Bible says is the father of the Gentiles. How about that? Here's the second one. The first Gentile kingdom is in Genesis 10.10. 10. It's the second one. Third, Acts chapter 10 is the opening door of the gospel to the Gentiles. Amen. That's when the gospel began through Cornelius. Romans chapter 10, it's that famous chapter we all use, what? As a missionary call to which timeline, which day and age? The Gentiles. Romans chapter 10, missionary call to Gentiles. Luke chapter 17, one of 10 lepers comes back and he is a Gentile. John chapter 10 speaks of the Gentile sheep, not of this fold. The last Gentile kingdom has how many kings? Ten kings, represented by ten toes of Daniel chapter 2, the image. Gentiles count by ten. Why? We got like ten finger over here. <laughs> and we go by tens. But God, he counts by sevens, Amen. which we know. We learned that in our previous Genesis study. Exodus chapter 10 is the termination of Moses dealing with Pharaoh. So notice right here we have something that's tied to the Gentiles. Nimrod, he's also called the Assyrian in Isaiah chapter 23. The title Assyrian is given to Nimrod. And this will be found in Isaiah chapter 23. Some of you might go, why is he known as the Assyrian? Because look at these cities that would be found in the location of Assyria. That's why the Assyrian would be a reference to Nimrod. Dr. Upman writes, Nimrod is called the Assyrian in Isaiah chapter 23 verse 13. And he is the founder of the industry that produces Diana's, Christopher's, Jude's, Mary's, Joseph's, and Blessed John the Baptist, at least according to Isaiah chapter, guess what number? 10 verse 10. Wow. All right. Let's take a look. All right. Go through there. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 10 verse 10. Turn to the book of Isaiah, and then we'll look at chapter 10. We'll read verse 10. 
Notice that uh, in this passage, we see idols mentioned, right? And remember, Nimrod is the Gentile that pr produced the worship service. Idol worship is a Gentile worship. Look at 10.10, as my hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols. Who's the one that spread out idol worship from the kingdoms? It's Nimrod. And whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and of Samaria. Now, uh, for some of you who didn't know, when you study Nimrod's history, Nimrod's history, uh, that's where idol worship came from. How did idols begin? Well, remember, there were those sons of God who came on the earth, right? So then some of that knowledge and that inclination, that longing to go back to Genesis 6, where the gods lived among men, well, they don't have it literally there with them, those gods. So that's why they have to build those gods. Mankind has a tendency to go back to Genesis 6. It's very strange. It's very demonic and weird. So then they created these idols for that one. But in order for these idols, how they originated was from Nimrod when you read history. Nimrod was the guy who set up worshiping him and then he tied himself to sun worship and his mother, Semiramis, who became his wife. Yeah, you heard me right. I didn't mess up my English, okay? I'm not asleep. He married his mom. That's how disgusting it was. So Nimrod, uh, he married his mother, Semiramis, and then Semiramis argued when she gave birth to a child named Tammuz, and when Nimrod died, uh, accounts say that Shem was so angry at Nimrod that he killed him because of all the wickedness and the perversion that he was doing. I don't know how much of that is true or false, but there, seemed, there were legends and accounts of that one. So when Nimrod was killed, Semiramis argued that when she gave birth to a baby, this is Nimrod reincarnated when the sun came up. And then she judged the pattern of the weather, weather to be December 25th. Dun, dun, dun. That's why you have to have those shiny glimmers on top of a tree. And that's the reason why there's that, uh, that's why Christmas is tied, for some of you who didn't know, it is tied to pagan worship. It is tied to basically, you're not celebrating Jesus' birthday, you're celebrating Nimrod's birthday, for some of you who didn't know. So that's what it is. Now, look, I'm not, uh, birthdays, believe it or not, is tied to pagan references to in the Bible, for some of you who didn't know. And we're not going to make a big deal by saying, you know, no, you can't sing happy birthday, all right? So we're not, we don't do that way with Merry Christmas. Now, our church, we don't observe Christmas, but sometimes some of the brethren might get together or they themselves personally might have Christmas. We're not against that as long as you don't adhere to something pagan, okay? As long as you're concentrating on using the day to glorify the Lord, then this is something that we can let go because Romans chapter 14 says days don't matter to the Lord. So as long as you observe it for the Lord's sake, then that's fine. So it's the same thing with birthdays. Some of you didn't know this, but wedding rings, for some of you who didn't know, there are ties to paganism with that one too, okay? <laughs> so I'm not going to take off the wedding ring. All right, yeah, 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 you're not gonna, oh, we got some smart guys right here, all right? So uh, I think we, we, lose, we lose everybody in our church if I started teaching that. So, some, so you got to realize, church, you can't be too much filled with so much knowledge Amen. that you lose something practical out of your life, Amen. that you lose charity, Amen. understanding with people. So Amen. we do that, so we do the same thing with Christmas and other days, okay? All right. Now, uh, interesting though, when I mentioned about Christmas and tied to Nimrod, uh, what chapter would it be in Jeremiah? Probably is it's, yeah, is it ten or am I wrong about that, or is it eight? I think maybe. Let me make sure. I could be wrong. Is it ten? Yeah, it's ten. How about that? Ten. Dun dun dun. Gentile day. How about that? Nimrod's day. Ties to Nimrod. Jeremiah ten. So there's no doubt about it, all right? There's no doubt about it. There's something that's all tied together here with Nimrod. All right, let's go back. 
So let's look at these areas. We talked about 10. So his kingdom was in these cities that I mentioned, and they're all in the land of Shinar. Dr. Ockman says on page 276 of his commentary, uh, Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. All the cities have been located and ex excavated. Although Bible commentators vary on their exact location, and then he mentions Jerome, Eusebius, Cockhart, Michaelis, Kalish, Clericus, Noble, Lang, Kyle, etc., of all these commentators. He says there might be some variations, but at the very least, what they all share in common is they are within 200 miles of Babylon, identifying the area as Shinar, the location of the first United Nations building for world peace, Dr. Upman says. United Nations is not the first. There was one before. That's Genesis 11. Genesis 11. They were building something. They were going to make a name for themselves. Why? What, the, what you're seeing today is not something new. Let's all build a name for humanity. Let's elevate us. Isn't humanism the rise and the number one religion, religion, religion in public schools today? Secular humanism, all right? All that pagan worship. Dr. Ruttman interestingly says, and uh, the area as Shinar and the location of the Telstar jazz band, which signaled the time for worship of the male sex symbol, 60 times 6 times 6. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1 through 8. And you know what that is? That's Nebuchadnezzar's image. How about that? Where? Where Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Mm. Revelation 17, the Antichrist kingdom is going to be called what? Babylon. See, that spirit carries on. They're all tied. Nimrod is undoubtedly tied to the Antichrist. Now let's look at verse 11. Verse 11. Out of that land, so Shinar, went forth Asher and built in Nineveh. Now, Asher is not from Ham's line, for some of you who didn't know. Asher, he is from Shem's line. So what does he have to do with Ham over there? What in the world is going on with Asher, who comes from Shem's line? Well, he built Nineveh. That's why you see the Assyrians here. They come from mixtures of Shem and Ham. So you'll see that mixture. Genesis 10 is the text that you will see where I showed you in other names and other people, there was intermingling going on. Why there was intermingling going on? God originally, like I taught you, wanted them all to spread out and go into their bounds. I'm not going to prove that one. I already did that last time. Uh, so God originally wanted to do that. Why? Because he knows what mankind is capable of at Genesis 11 when they integrate and come together. That's why today, what happened with all the countries uniting together? It's easier to become what? One world, the Antichrist government, because of what's going on. So, because there was intermingling going on, which was Thomas at Genesis 10, and that's not what originally God wanted. That's why he started a new group of people, which is through Abraham. Why? He couldn't do it through Noah's line. There was too much corruption going on. Nimrod, even though he lost his unified kingdom at the Tower of Babel, he still shared a one-world religion somehow. How? Through his idol worship. But they, uh, but they just translated to different names. Semiramis was changed to Venus, and then Ishtar and Diana. Nimrod was translated to Jupiter and Zeus. That's what we see. That's why you're going to see, it's so amazing, there were Jesuit missionaries who visited China or in other Asian countries, and they were shocked to see an image of a mother and a baby child, of an idol that people worshipped, just like the Jesuits did, just like those Catholics did. They share the same paganism. So you notice that that's the devil's spirit trying to integrate and unify everything. Yeah. 
Why? Because mankind, when they go without God, the tendency is you combine every cultural belief and system together and mesh it to a world of tolerance. You notice that? That's what the one world system today is emphasizing, tolerance. That's why you get too many different colors of the rainbow now. And I'm not talking about Noah's rainbow. Why? They're trying to tolerate not just religion now, not just culture, but it's gone so far to try to produce so, mu so much multi-gender things and so many different sexual references that it's too sick Amen. to talk about. That's what happens. If we're looking at Asher, look at verse 22. He is definitely the son of Shem. You'll notice that at verse 2. He is from Shem's line. What happens? He leaves and uh, Dr. Upman says he leaves and founds Nineveh. Rehoboth and Kala. Okay, so look at Genesis. Uh, I'm reading the passage too while reading Dr. Upman's commentary. So look at verse 11. And then verse 12, verse 11 and 12, all right? That way you can follow along with me and not get lost. Dr. Upman writes, He leaves and founds Nineveh, Rehoboth, and Kala, and reason between Nineveh and Kala, the same is a great city. Okay, so what's going on is Asher, he leaves Shinar, where Ham was taking over, and then Asher, who was who was originally from Shem line, somehow conglomerated with Ham. And then, as a conglomeration of Shem and Ham, he goes out and then builds the city of Nineveh. Now, you know Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria. That's found at the book of Jonah. So they're all tied right here. What they all sh share in common in this line is Nineveh. That's why Assyrians are a mixture of Hamites and Shemites. Or maybe Shemites themselves, either or. But the point is that he goes out over there and then starts the Assyrian Empire. Nimrod, like I mentioned to you before, he is known as the Assyrian. So it may be possible that while Nimrod... He was doing something where Assyria, where it's uh, Assyrian and Babylonian. Because remember, when you keep going back, before the Assyrian Empire and before the Babylonian Empire, they all had to have a one father somewhere when you go backwards in time, right? So they originate from Nimrod. That's the idea. That's why it's accurate to put Nimrod with the Assyrians, for, for some of you who are kind of confused on that one. But like I mentioned before, Asher... Uh, he started the Assy main Assyrian Empire, I could word it that way, and uh, starts out Nineveh. Now, all these other city names, this is how it goes. Dr. Upman says there is some disagreement among Laird, Kalish, Noble, Kyle, Lang, Smith, and Murphy as to the exact location, look in your Bible, of Reason and Kala, because that's the one we want to know, right? Because Nineveh, we already know about it, but Rehoboth and Kala, we would like to know where it is. Nineveh is pretty obvious where we would want it to be. It was a famous city in the Bible, so there were archaeologists trying to discover it. And it's like one of the capital cities of the Assyrian Empire. But then we're trying to locate Rehoboth and Kala. So Dr. Upman says right here, But all, even though there's so many different versions and variations, they do share something in common. They're at least within 80 miles of Nineveh which lies near the branching out of the great Zab River from the Tigris. So that's where those cities would be approximately located. Now, this is the confusing part. Uh, it says, uh, and Resen, which uh, between Nineveh and Kala, the same is a great city. So then what is that referring to? The same is a great, so there's a city called Reason that's located between Nineveh and Kala. We get that. The same is a great city. Which city is the great city? It could be a reference to Reason, which seems more likely when you look at context there, right? It could be referring to Reason as becoming like a great city. But the thing is, Nineveh is most more likely known throughout history as the great city of the Assyrian Empire, right? So it could be the same as a great city would be referring to Nineveh. 
It could be referring to that. That's what Dr. Upman writes. But Dr. Upman writes here, so if there's a little bit of confusion right here to this inclusion of recent, because it's between Nineveh and Kala, right? The idea then is this. Dr. Upman says the chances are Nineveh includes Kala and Resin. They are suburbs, and the great city is Nineveh. Now, he mentions right here, if you look at Jonah chapter 3 and verse 3, as well as Nahum chapter 1, 2, and 3. So, uh, we're not going to turn there, but if you look at these passages... You compare Nahum with Jonah 3, 3, and then you're going to notice that that interpretation is very, very possible. But I think it's very logical. I think it's the most reasonable, how Dr. Upman mentioned that. Okay, let's go back. Let's continue on with the rest of the generations. Chapter 10 and verse 13. Now that we covered the Assyrians, let's cover the rest of Ham's lineage here. And Mizraim begat Ludim, and Anamim, and Lehabim, and Naphtuhim. All right, so that's self-explanatory. A guy named Mizraim, so let's write it out here. And then let's divide his children, shall we? All right. The first one is Ludim. Now, Ludim, Dr. Upman says, his descendants are the Lawata tribe. So, obviously, that's Africa that we know. Ham's lineage, we already, disco uh, we already discovered that he's the father of the black descendants which settles near Mauritania, Western Africa, if I pronounce that right. All right, Anamim, the next guy. Now, his location and descendants, his group is, all, uh, his group is known as Rock Men, also known as Rock Men, the Rock Men. They probably settled in north or northwest Egypt, somewhere there. Probably north or northwest Egypt. The other one is Lahabim or Lehabim. The Lubim of North Africa. So from Lubim, also from North Africa. Let's put Mauritania here. The Lubim of North Africa, west of Egypt. So it's going to be west of Egypt's side. And then there are two references that Dr. Upman writes here concerning this group of people. He mentions Second Chronicles. Uh, I can't write this one, but just uh, you can rewind this in the video. But I'll mention it to you guys. Write it down. Second Chronicles, chapter twelve, verse three. Second Chronicles, chapter twelve, verse three. And then Nahum, chapter three, verse nine. Nahum, chapter three, verse nine. This is according to the statements of Michaelis, Kalish, and Murphy. And you can also look at the Pulpit Commentary, Volume 1, page 160. Another person is not to him, not to him, the last guy in that verse. Not to him means red colored or flame colored. So his name means flame or red colored. Habitants are located in central Egypt below Aswan. So central Egypt below Aswan. Uh, 
The next one is Pathrusim. If we look at verse 14 now. And Pathrusim and uh, Kasluhim, out of whom came Philistim. Uh, we'll come back to there. So let's go to Pathrusim. Pathrusim. Pathrusim, believe it or not, it plainly means Pathros. So you know what Pathros is if you know your uh, Bible or in history, that's in Upper Egypt. If you want to write down the references to Pathros, I'm going to give it to you if you're ready. All right, so it is uh, Isaiah 11.11. 11. Isaiah 11.11. 11. And then the next one is uh, Jeremiah 44.1. Jeremiah 44.1. The next one is Kasluhim. Kasluhim. Oh, excuse me. All right. Now, Kasluhim, Dr. Upman writes, this is very interesting, another group of uh, Egyptians. So they're a different uh, group of Egyptians because, remember, they were migrating. So even though they go to Egypt, then they migrate to a different location. So they all keep migrating, spreading out. There are another group of Egyptians out of whom came the Philistines. Because look at that verse. It says out of who came Philistine, right? So these are where the Philistines came out. This is an interesting group of people that you want to study. People who are interested in the leftover descendants of the giants. Because that's where Goliath and then his big uh, brothers also, his brothers came out. But this is where the Philistines came from. It's Kasluhim. That's where Delilah, who overcame Samson's strength as well. And notice that they're all from Ham's line over here. The Philistines were one of the number one people that was a thorn on the side of the Jews, the Philistines. They were a mighty group of people that gave the Jews such a hard time. Famous, uh, famous enemies came out in this Bible. You get Achish, Goliath, uh, Goliath Delilah, and etc., now, there's some uh, criticisms. I want you to go to Jeremiah 47.4. There are two passages. Jeremiah 47.4 and Amos 9. Amos 9.7. Amos 9.7. And Jeremiah chapter 44, verse... Uh, 47, excuse me. Jeremiah 47, verse 4. Jeremiah 47, verse 4. This is important to know because you're going to get Bible scholars who correct your King James Bible. They're going to say here, when you look at this passage, it's pretty obvious. Verse 14, your King James Bible says, and Kasluhim, out of whom came Philistim, right? So that's pretty obvious. The Philistines came from Kasluhim. But then there are people who argue, no, it's and Kaphtorim. So, Notice the last part of verse, what is the right question, because that don't make sense. Verse 14, it says, and Kaphtorim, right? So that's the next person uh, from Mizraim's line. When we go to, so we're going to debate now, Kaphtorim and Kasluhim. So then, the question right here is, did the Philistines come from Kasluhim or from Kaptorhim. Now, I kind of read some parts from Frederick Widdowson's book, which is uh, very interesting and uh, open to the possibility that, remember, the Philistines, they came from uh, the ancient Grecian area where that was the timeline you would hear about those gods coming down and those famous legends like Achilles, Hercules, and etc. So these Philistines, they come from... Uh, J it's possible they could come from a Japhethite line. But then I told you because they came to the land of Canaan, which is Ham's area, that's why the Philistines would be more known as the Hamites. But this is more accurate when you look at Genesis 10 itself. It says, out of whom came Philistine from Ham. So the Philistines, they're undoubtedly Hamites. But the Bible scholars, what they'll try to do is that they'll try to mention that the Philistines, they came from Kaphtorhim, which is from an island off of Crete. 
and that might connect to the ancient Greek culture. So then the Philistines, uh, they're not genuinely Hamites. But that's not actually true. What, there are several cases what they don't understand. One, the Bible says so, which is pretty obvious. All right, it says, out of whom came, from who caslu him. But then they assume that, no, 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 it, it should have, out of whom came Philistine, the writers meant it was connected to captor him. So they just made an incorrect wording. No, your Bible's correct, scholars are wrong. Amen. Secondly, secondly, just because the Philistines, they may have came from a region of captor, all right, so that's pretty interesting. They came from captor. The Philistines, a location. If you look at Jeremiah chapter 47, verse 4, look at the wording right here. Oh, I just lost my bookmark. I'm sorry about that. All right, let me turn over there quickly. The Bible reads here, Because uh, of the day that cometh to spoil all the Philistines, and to cut off from Tyrus and Zidon, uh, every helper that remaineth. For the Lord will spoil the Philistines, the remnant of the country of what? Kaptor. So then because of that wording, it may seem like that the Philistines, that they are descendants from Kaptorim. But here are, se uh, here are several answers, which is pretty easy. Dr. Ruckman argue they come from Kaptor, but that doesn't mean they're Kaptorims. Uh, the proof text, which is extremely strong, that he used is Amos 9. This is very strong. Look at Amos 9. Look at Amos chapter 9, and then we'll look at verse 7, Amos 9, 7. Jeremiah 47 is not proving that the Philistines came, uh, that the Philistines are from Kaphtorim. It's actually arguing the opposite. It's arguing that they're like sojourners or foreigners who resided in that land. That's why the Philistines, I mean, there's no doubt, the Philistines, they were sojourning, residing. What's the evidence? If you claim, if you claim they came from Crete, what were they doing in Canaan later on? See, they were wandering all over. So that's evidence one. Evidence two is the Bible right here at Amos chapter 9, verse 7. Are ye not as the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel, saith the Lord. Have not I brought up Israel, the Israelites, out of where? Canaan, Israel, or out of where? Egypt. Does that mean the Israelites are Egyptians? No. Keep reading. And the Philistines from where? Does that mean Philistines, see, are they Kaptorins? Keep reading. And the Syrians from what? Kurd. I mean, Syrians are from Syria. And then, does that mean that Syrians are Kurites or something that you want to call it? Whatever the right wording is for that one. But you notice right here, that doesn't prove that the Philistines, that, they come, that they're Kaptorims. They might come from Kaptor, but according to Amos 9 and Jeremiah, and not only that, the history of the Philistines, if you truly believe they came off of Crete, it proves that they weren't born from that region or uh, citizens of that region or their ethnicity is from there. They're just sojourning, wandering, residing different places. <coughs> it's like all of us today in America, right? Your ethnicity is from a different country, but uh, we reside in this country, America. So that's the idea. Let's go back to Genesis 10. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 10. So notice that the Bible's right, scholars are wrong. That's a simple answer. Dr. Uckman writes here, as he was, uh, he, he did a very good job on this, but then he writes here, which is pretty funny. The Philistines came, come from Kasluhim racially, and after that, they can sail from Crete, Creek, Crack, Creek, or Croc for all I care. They are still related to Kasluhim and Kaptorim as brothers, and their father was Mizraim. <laughs> That's what he argues. But here's another answer to this, which is what Dr. Uckman gave. He gave another argument here, which is pretty smart. Notice the wording, which is very close. The wording of verse 14, Kasluhim, Kaptorim. 
Notice the very close wording right there. That shows the closeness of these brothers. If it shows the closeness of these brothers, it can also show that the Philistines, if they wanted to migrate from Kasluhim, they can easily go to Kaptorim next door. So they can go that close. All right, so in your Bible, it's Kasluhim. Kasluhim. It may be that the, because Kasluhim and Kaptorim, that they're so uh, related that and so close with each other, they may have been close with each other. That's why Kasluhim descendants would go to Kaptorim's area or maybe even intermingle or go to that line. Let's go to Genesis chapter 10 and then let's wrap this up. We're going to wrap up at verse 15. Verse 15. And Canaan, all right, the next most famous person you want to know is Canaan. Now Canaan, as we start a new branch here, he begat Sidon, his firstborn. So Sidon is the firstborn son of Canaan and Heth. So Sidon and Heth. The city is named after uh, the son, and you can find this uh, city name, Sidon, which is very interesting in your Bible for some of you who didn't know. So Zidon can be found at Joshua chapter 11, verse 8. Joshua chapter 11, verse 8. And Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Well known being situated on the sea coast north of Caesarea and Tyre. This is the area where the tribe of Dan, so we're going to see all these famous connections here. These famous names, which is responsible for a lot of Satan worship or Nimrod's religion, revived. It was carried on through Canaan to Zidon. Now, I told you, if you studied my intermediate discipleship class, you notice the interesting things I point out how Nimrod spread his religion. And that's, it was going down to eat. God destroyed the two biggest world powers that were the biggest threats of spreading out Nimrod's religion. That was Egypt. God crushed that through Moses. And then Canaan, God crushed that through Joshua. But the Jews didn't finish the job completely. So then because they failed in Canaan, it was spreading out to the northern part of Israel, Canaan, to Phoenicia. And remember those Phoenicians were the one responsible for spreading out Nimrod's worship. And then as the Israelites kept extinguishing the giants and the rest of the people carrying Nimrod's religion, remember Phoenician coins were interestingly found at South, Africa, uh, South America. And notice that their building structures is similar to the pyramids of Egypt. They're all tied right here. It's intensely interesting, this location. So Zidon is an important person here. The tribe of, Dr. Upman writes on page 280, the tribe of Dan settles near here and joins in the Baal worship. Baal, that's another name for Nimrod, all right? Baal worship of the Phoenicians as Zidon. Ahab marries a Zidonian princess. That's Jezebel. That's why the Bible condemns what kind of worship at Revelation? Jezebel worship. This is all tied to Nimrod. This is all tied to Roman Catholic. They all share the same spirit together here. The Phoenicians were great seamen, yet with all their Shemitic blood, so they were Shemites, the Phoenicians, but then they got involved with Ham's system. Ham plainly has a share of the honors for, this is so interesting, listen up. Ham plainly has a share of the honors, for one will find on a rock in southern Ireland, over there in Great Britain. Did you remember your intermediate discipleship class? I mentioned that it's possible those sons of God, lineage, religion, or civilization, as they were being pushed away from the Israelites, they had to go to the furthest landmass near the ocean. So what did they do? They went to South America, where they would be left alone. Or the furthest landmass, when you keep pushing north, would be Great Britain area as one of them. And remember I mentioned about those Arthurian legends, which is so interesting. Those sons of God accounts and stories where some of that may have been remaining during that time. Why? Because those sons of God or their descendants may have fled over there. 
But if we keep reading on, Dr. Upman writes, Southern, what he says here about Ireland, one will find on a rock, rock in Southern Ireland these words inscribed, quote, we are Canaanites who fled from Joshua, the son of Nun, the robber. That's deep. Chew on that rock for a while, right? 16 verses of the National Song of Ireland end with, I am Patty the Canaanite. Dr. Ottman says, this explains better than reams of research papers why South Ireland still worships the Phoenician idols of Canaan. Behind the wearing, oh, the green lurks, the, back, the black robed priest who bears no more resemblance to Patrick than Ermin Goring does to Theo Theodore Epp. <laughs> so they're all Thai. All right, let's cover Heth next time. Heavenly Father, I pray that today's Genesis studies have been a blessing to the hearers and made us more aware of our history, where we come from, and then Satan's religion and civilization descendants come from as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.